ship's got to know where it's going. And navigators have tools to assist them with that. But when we think about our future, what are the tools that we use? I think there are two fundamentals. One is knowledge. You've got to understand how social processes work, how economic processes work, and how environmental processes work. But then you've then got to have the imagination to work out how they're going to co-evolve together to, as the future unfolds. When we think about our future, we're guided a lot by our understanding of the past. Most of us understand our history as a continuous process of progress from fire and from fire and stone to bronze to iron, steel, computers, genetics, nanotechnology, finally to the world portrayed in science fiction. That's the way we imagine our future. It's a continuous process of progress, isn't it, when we look back? Except when you look at our history through the lens of population and technology, you actually see a different picture. Development isn't, or hasn't been, a continuous process. For a very long time, humans were hunters and gatherers and drew their resources from the environment, the grass and the trees that grew there. And populations were very stable. And then we discovered this wonderful new technology, agriculture, and populations grew rapidly in particular locations and it spread very rapidly across the world. So what we saw uh, for the last 10,000 years up to 1800 was once again a relatively stable period. Population grew slowly. Uh, it would grow quite rapidly within a generation, but then it would be stopped by some combination of famine, war and disease and it would drop back down again. And so the net growth during that period was very slow. And then in 1800, around 1900, 1800, something changed, something very fundamental changed. And what changed was we, we started to use a number of technologies, um, most importantly fossil fuels, but a range of other technologies that improved agriculture. Uh, we had the so-called discoveries of the world where we spread out and began to exploit the resources from the whole world, and we engaged in trade. And a consequence of all of those things that happened uh, back there at the end of the 18th, the beginning of the 19th century, was that effectively the environmental constraints that had kept the cap on population for 10,000 years were fundamentally relaxed. The environmental capacity of the planet grew dramatically as a result of those technologies. We were able to take a whole lot more yield from a unit of land. And it grew faster than the rate of population growth. And as a result, environmental constraints became functionally irrelevant. So we've been through a period of 200 years or so where environmentally con environmental constraints haven't been very important for us. But then the question becomes, what happens next? Because in the progress model of the world, those environmental constraints are not part of the story. That progress model of the world was uh, an economic model that was created during the 19th and 20th centuries to explain this growth phase. It doesn't say anything about what happens at the end of it. And if you think about it for a little while, what you start to, to recognise is that our economy has grown dramatically. Our economy has grown about 60 times, over 60 times since, 1980, 19, since, sorry, since 1800. It's projected to grow about another three times uh, between now and 2050. We've drawn the, uh, on the chart the, the line there that turns down is the line of uh, sustainable environment productivity. And the reason we're drawing that is turning down is because most of the ecosystem services that humans depend on are in decline. Uh, the one really notable exception that is growing is our ability to provide more food. We're providing more food for people uh, as the population is growing and it's projected to grow from about 7 billion now to somewhere between 9 and 10 billion uh, in the year 2050. So uh, what are the consequences of this, of this economy growing so large that we're now entering a, a phase where the environmental constraints are re-emerging and becoming important again? The first and most obvious one of those is that our climate is changing because we're changing the atmosphere. And about 20 years ago, the world got quite concerned about that and had a conference in Rio de Janeiro to agree how to respond to it. Actually, interestingly, uh, 20 years later, people are going back to Rio. There's a lot of talk about it, isn't it? We hear so much about uh, 
climate change, low carbon economy, sustainability, uh, price premiums for low carbon products, etc. Well, what's the result of all that? There's the result of it. Carbon dioxide concentration, really unaffected by all of this talk, continuing to rise dramatically. And uh, you can almost discern an acceleration in the increase rather than a decline uh, in the increase if you look at it. And, if, and, and just another little factoid about those numbers. That you can see over that period the carbon dioxide concentration has grown from about 280 to nearly 400 parts per million. Well, the difference between an ice age and the, and the period before the growth period that's shown here is 100 units. 100 parts per million in the ice age, 280 parts per million in traditional agriculture, around about 400 now. The point I'm making is we are exerting serious stresses on the atmosphere. So don't be talked by all, don't be fooled by all the talk or by all the media. You know, the media presents both sides of the story. The scientists uh, will tell you a pretty, pretty, pretty common story. And uh, what, uh, what they will say. Um, is that if you change the climate by more than about two degrees from a 1910-1900 baseline, you create changes that are too damaging and you create unacceptable risk of triggering abrupt climate change. Uh, we all think that climate changes gradually, look at the models, the models all show it changing gradually. The reality, if you look at the historical data, is it doesn't change gradually and it can change quite quickly as well. Decades, sometimes even years. What the climate scientists are saying now is that we're not likely to slow the, uh, the, 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 the addition of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere sufficiently to stop uh, an increase of 2 degrees Celsius. It's gone up by about 0.8 degrees now. There's about another 0.6 that's already in the atmosphere waiting to warm the planet. It's because of the concentrations in there and it hasn't had its warming effect yet. Uh, it's pretty easy to see another 0.6 being created simply by the momentum that we're establishing. So uh, what that means is that the climate scientists are saying, well, look, pretty serious situation. You know, if you think about the next 20 years or so, and I'm drawing a very broad brush through here, you know, what we need is something like a 20% reduction in emissions from fossil fuels and other sources in the next 20 years. But at the same time, we're growing the population and we're growing the economy. So uh, I, was, I was rather surprised to find, actually, given all this talk about uh, windmills and when you travel around, you see them everywhere. Uh, we still get about 75% of our energy from fossil fuels. And if you look forward with current policies and the projections of where our new energy is going to come from, uh, we expect to get another, about 75% of the growth from fossil fuels under current policies. That is an important caveat under current policies, but I don't see them changing all that much yet. So here we've got the climate scientists saying, let's reduce the emissions by 40% by in 20 years, roughly. And we've got the economic planners saying let's increase the uh, fossil fuels use by 40% in the same period of time. Those two requirements are fundamentally incompatible and I'm surprised that we're not all noticing that and worrying about it and discussing it and trying to figure out what to do about that. It seems almost invisible. <coughs> so I see a couple of icebergs ahead. I, I think the world will figure out that there's a problem and we're going to have to change our policies and change our activities and move to a low, low carbon economy pretty quickly. And I think we're going to have to get used to a lot more climate change than we're currently expecting because I don't think it's going to be enough to control the situation. But there's another big iceberg that's looming as well. And again, I think it's one that we haven't really noticed as much as we might have. Uh, have a look at this data. This data shows the real prices in uh, sort of some kind of international dollars for important uh, inputs to our economy, energy, food, and minerals. And what it shows is that for food and uh, food and metals and minerals, uh, there was a price decline from 1963 to 2000. It's indexed at 100 as 2000. It's the year 2000. So there was a, 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 serious, a, a quite a, a material decline, and that's driven by increasing efficiency, better technology, um, you know, discoveries of resources that are large and can be exploited. And then around 2000, something changed. Well, the first thing that changed is that the energy prices started to rise, and of course energy is embodied in everything else, and energy is not getting scarce in the sense that we can't find it. But instead of finding it in nice 
nice pools close to the surface and near a port, we're now finding energy deep under the ocean and it's a lot more costly to pull out. So instead of energy costing us $20 a, a barrel in uh, about 10, 12 years ago, the marginal cost of new energy sources is about $70 a barrel now and the price is ranging at the moment about 85 or 100 or whatever, whenever you want to have a look at it, but it's way, way above that $20 that it was a little while ago. But the other thing that's happening is that materials like copper, you know, again, you used to find better resources and you could pull that out, you had better technologies for using it. Um, but what we're finding now, of course, is the copper is deeper in the ground, it's a lower grade, it's more expensive to get out, it's more expensive to process, it requires more energy, and so the costs of all these things are going up. And to some degree, that's all been masked by the shift of a lot of our manufacturing into Asia. Because what we're seeing is the raw materials costs are going up, uh, the processing costs are going down, and therefore we're not seeing this hitting us in our pocket as directly as it might. The people who it is hitting in the pocket are those people who uh, don't buy a lot of manufacturers and who are dependent on imports of food and energy. Most notably people in North Africa and the Middle East and what they do when they run, uh, find that their household budgets are uh, getting out of control is they go into the streets and protest and change their governments. This change of government is not all about uh, dictatorship and uh, political regime changes that's been presented. A lot of it's about people being unhappy about not getting enough to eat, and unfortunately, regime change doesn't do that, doesn't fix that. So, um, prices, I think, are likely to continue to increase, because the drivers of that are about the uh, increasing um, size of the economy relative to the resources that are available to support it, but that shift to China and to Asia is a one-time effect. So it's, it's, it's likely that we'll see these things hitting our household budgets uh, more as the future unfolds. So we've borrowed from the future, arguably in the financial arenas and also in the environmental arenas, uh, and now we've got to figure out how to deal with that and how to pay it back. The, the good news is that New Zealand's fairly well positioned for the kinds of changes that I anticipate. We've got uh, fairly abundant land, largely because we have a relatively small population. Uh, we have water. We have... Uh, a predicted climate response to climate change, which is uh, benign relative to some other countries. Uh, and we get a benefit from the gain in food prices because that's an important export for us. But we are going to import problems from the rest of the world and we need to be prepared for that. You know, it, perhaps it's a little bit like, you know, we're the first class passengers on the Titanic, you know, we're okay, nothing's going to happen to us. Um, but, uh, you know, and it is going to be the poor and populous countries that are going to be most uh, seriously affected, and you can see them being affected already. Uh, but everyone's going to be affected. I mean, the third-class passengers on the, on the, on the Titanic had 75% deaths, uh, but, but the first-class passengers had 40% 40, 40 deaths. So if you, th if you think about the, the way these uh, climate environment processes are going to unfold, you know, the, the pain may, may be felt initially in, in one place, but it spreads for various reasons. So preparation is a very big topic, too big for me to cover in the time that's allowed here. I just want to illustrate a couple of changes. Um, uh, the first one is you know, get ready for climate change and be ready to shift to a low-carbon economy because the world may require us to do that. And ensure we have sufficient and secure supplies of what we need. You know, we've been surprised by the global financial crisis, and yet there were warnings. We've been surprised by the Twin Towers and the war on terror, and again, there were warnings. You know, there are warnings now, and we can be surprised. These things are obvious in hindsight, but it's the imagination that allows you to prepare effectively. We should ensure that we have sufficient and secure supplies of what we need. Should an overshoot crisis, that is where we grow beyond the capacity of the environment to support us, lead to a, uh, a, a collapse of population and economy, we want to be ready for that. You know, we want to make sure we've got supplies of energy, we've got critical technologies, we want to have tractors, we want to have electricity generation, we want to have seeds, phosphate and selenium. And what happened with Fukushima and what happened with the Thai floods was it revealed that the global supply chains are very intricate, very connected, and very easily interrupted. And we need to be prepared for the consequences of that. We also need to ensure that our community has the skills and the resilience that would be required to respond to circumstances that are different from the ones that we currently anticipate. On the Titanic, the wireless operator got six warnings, but he was too busy sending passenger messages. He had another mission. And the ship was unsinkable anyway, so why worry about it? In New Zealand, we don't really believe an, an overshoot crisis of the kind that I'm talking about can happen. The Titanic was full steam ahead. It was travelling at 22.5 knots. Uh, full, full speed was 23. We're travelling full speed ahead too. You know, our most important societal goal is to grow the, grow the economy, to increase GDP. 
GDP of course includes waste, sickness, crime, uh, doesn't take any account of the damage to the environment, but you know, we're trying to maximize that, we measure our performance all the time, we worry about it if it isn't growing. But if these issues are uh, so important, why is there such an insufficient response? Well, my argument on that is that actually there are two different ways of viewing the world. The first way is shown on the left-hand side here, and it was a, a, a set of understandings that were created during the period of unconstrained growth from 1800 to roughly 2000. And it, 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 it's used to explain that period of growth. It doesn't say anything much about what happens at the end of that period of growth. The set of understandings on the right hand side come from science and uh, ecology and uh, understanding how biological processes uh, operate, understanding how civilizations, other civilizations have evolved in history. It tells quite a different story. What we've got going on in our world today is a, is a conflict, a battle between these two world views. So, uh, where are we? What is the situation? Well, at the moment we're using about 1.5 Earths on a sustainable basis. The economy is going to grow by three more times to 2050, so it's going to go up to well over two Earths. So, it's unsustainable, it's going to get more unsustainable, and eventually it has to correct to become sustainable. So, we need to find a way to as soft a landing as we can. So, isn't that what our leaders are for? What are our leaders doing? Well, many business leaders are leading, and that's a great thing. But if you actually look at those business leaders and you look at their businesses, many of the businesses they are leading are businesses that can either gain from the response or have a fairly easy adjustment. The businesses that are detrimentally affected by making the kinds of changes are fighting back. And they're fighting back for very good reason. I've been a director of several companies. One of the things you know when you're a director is you are required by law to act in the interests of the country. Sorry, in the interests of the company. <laughs> You are not required to act in the long-term interests of your country. That's what you do as an individual. But as a member of the board of a, of a, who directs a company, you must act in the interests of that company. So it's not surprising they behave that way. They are required to behave that way. And those who are opposed to change are well-organized, they're well-resourced, and they're keen to lead government decision-makers. Governments themselves have quite short time horizons due to the election cycle. And uh, governments also have to follow what people want. And what people want is consumption, and if people tell governments that's what they want, then that's what governments have to deliver. So if governments and businesses aren't going to be the leaders that we're looking for, who is going to be the leaders that we're looking for? And the answer is it's us. It's individuals who have to lead, because we're the only ones who can actually change this situation. Both businesses and governments are trapped by their circumstances. So what do you do if you want to be a leader? Well, first of all, build your own understanding so you can form your own judgments. I've had an interesting experience over the last year or so um, with a couple of people who've, who've learned and got across this data, and it's interesting to see how quickly they change their views when they start to understand what's really going on in the world. Secondly, lead others. Lead others, not lead governments, because if you try to lead governments, you're just putting your force against uh, a force that's too powerful. You actually need more people. So activists who try to change governments or businesses, there's not enough support behind them. You actually need more people. You need to lead other individuals and lead other individuals in a way that they will lead other individuals to create sufficient momentum to be a countervailing force against the, uh, the forces that simply want to maximise short-term economic output. And finally, have a look at your own behaviour. Uh, it's pretty obvious that you can't do much acting on your own, but your own behaviour is important because you, you do set an example to others, and if you want to influence others, you need to set an example to them. And eventually, when enough people are behaving in ways that are helpful for long-term outcomes and to achieve a soft landing, then that will be what will create the momentum politically to uh, get the best possible response that we can. Thank you.